again for um, and to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my research here. Um, and I would like to welcome you to my talk. Um, the chicken or the egg problem in epidemiology, you might wonder what this is supposed to mean. So maybe um, I can give you a brief idea of what I'm interested in to start with. Um, I mean, if you look at epidemic processes, um, things might look quite convoluted and complex. So I'll have here a look at this network of people. You have the green ones, which are susceptible to infection. You have the red ones being infected, and the gray ones, which have recovered. But aside from going through this different state of disease, you see there's a lot of things that are going on. People enter the population. People leave the population. People change their contacts. Um, and... I mean, there are a lot of studies on these kinds of behaviors, and you could um, maybe just um, assess data, do experiments, have a look how the epidemics evolve. But um, what I'd really like to address here and to study um, is one key question, really, how far you could go on tackling this question analytically. And the key questions I'd like to address are, on the one hand, I mean, how does the topology and the dynamics of the transmis transmission network influence epidemics? And this is basically a question which has been researched quite intensively during the last years or the last decade even. Um, and I think there are already quite a few answers. I think the opposite side has been a bit more neglected, really, because it's not only that the network topology affects the epidemic spread, but also the epidemic affects how contacts are made or maintained or changed between susceptible, infected, or possibly recovered individuals. Um, and this is where we maybe can resolve the first issue where the, um, the chicken and the egg come into the game. Um, what the talk will be um, about is really how we could get a handle at this problem. Um, and I will do this along these lines. I will just say a few words on epidemic models, on contact networks. Before I introduce the epidemic model I will be working with. And to convince you that this is useful, I will just present you a few case studies before I go on with some more speculative outlooks. Okay, so epidemic models. I think the most, I mean, the most classical epidemic model is probably the SIR model. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. You just subdivide your population into three groups, say one, uh, just depending on whether your individuals are still susceptible for disease and healthy, whether they have already been infected and are infected at the time being, or whether they have recovered from the infection and acquired immunity. And you can write down a set of differential equations which is pretty straightforward and easy to solve. The only problem is that the assumptions are in most cases not very realistic because you assume a population or dynamics which is highly homogeneous, everybody interacts with everybody else, and this is probably not too realistic as you've seen in the introduction. So there are complex networks along which we make contacts, and um, I mean these contacts may of course vary depending on the disease. This might be like social context for the flu or sexual context for, for sexually transmitted diseases, but still it's not just a random mixture. And one way to handle this, is, or the easiest way to handle this, is in a configuration type model. Um, what you basically do is you further subdivide your group of susceptible, infected, and recovered persons into groups according to the number of trans of contacts they have along which transmission can possibly occur. Um, and this is something um, that I would like to, to go a bit more detail now to tell you about how you can formalize um, and keep track of the contact networks. Um, so just to, to give you a, a catch of what's going on, uh, um, here is just a, a small part of the network sketched. Um, and what you basically do is you look at the degree distribution, this uh, P, um, PK, which is just the probability for a certain person in the network to have a certain number of contacts. Um, you could equivalently look at um, 
the probability generating function. You see here that the, the, this is just a transformation of two quantities, and I will go back and forth between the two. While the, prob while the degree distribution is probably more intuitive and, and easily um, accessible to, to our minds, uh, the probability generating functions are quite handy to, to use in the equation. So I will use whatever is more suitable in the context, but keep in, just keep in mind that they are equivalent. So what, what could you look at? Um, I mean, you could start with the, uh, with the degree distribution in the whole network. So you do, do just bookkeeping about how many persons are there with a certain number of contact. Then you could look at um, the degree distribution among susceptible people, the one among infected and recovered. Um, another issue which may come into the story is that you have migration or demographic change, depending on the timescales that you're looking at. I mean, if you look for the flu, at the flu, you might think that probably you have a rather static population. But in case of HIV, as an example, um, where the epidemic spans decades, you certainly also have to take into account that people are born into the population, so enter the population or die due to natural causes. And... Um, so you could also consider that newcomers, or so the blue ones, enter the population, and you also have to um, put into the equation or into your model what kind of contact behaviors these are supposed to have. Um, I mean, you could also take an alternative perspective. Um, you could um, also ask, given that I have a certain number of contacts along which transmission could possibly occur, how likely is it that I am still susceptible, already infected, or already recovered. And you do, do basically the same bookkeeping. And what you get, of course, is that, I mean, if you have few contacts, you're more likely to stay longer susceptible and healthy. Whereas if you have many contacts, um, it's rather likely that you are infected or um, are already recovered, depending on the stage of disease. And this is basically um, uh, the, the point I'm, I'm heading to now, because what I've shown now is just a static snapshot. What you really would like to do is to follow the, the, the evolution of topology. How does this, this, um, this, this, this uh, confusing mingling of people and, and epidemics, um, how does this evolve? Yeah? Um, and to do this, um, we take a, take a step back and look a bit at the math behind. So I'll just give you a brief overview over the math behind the model. Um, it's not important to understand everything. Um, I, I will just give little notes on, on, which, on the publications where you maybe could, could read the details or just get back to me and, and we have a chat on that. Um, I mean, the, the first few equations just um, relate to epidemic prevalence pretty much looks like the SIR model. So people get infected at a certain rate um, and recover at a certain rate. What is new is that you have this quantity PSI. This is the probability that a contact made by a susceptible person is with an infected person. So here you, you, you plug in some information about correlations that arise between... Uh, for the contact among healthy and infected persons. So to go on, you, you will have also to derive um, equations for, for these quantities PSI and PSS, so the probabilities of susceptible person, uh, uh, susceptible persons links to contact to susceptible or infected persons. Uh, and this is for the static case. You could also consider demographic change or change of partners within a network. Um, you will notice that there are these terms GS here, so derivatives, partial derivatives of the probability generating function of the degree distribution among susceptible persons. So to close the set of equations, you have also to write down equations for this. Um, we've done this, and in addition also for the probability generating function among infected and recovered persons, because we really would like to follow the whole, the whole topological evolution. Um, and for those of you being a bit more familiar with epidemiology, um, this, this approach is, of course, pretty close related to some earlier work of Waltz and Miller. Um, 
but however, they did not look at demographic change, and um, they did not really focus that much on the topological evolution. So, um, if you now would like maybe to get a feeling for this equation or play around a bit, um, ah, I was a bit too fast. Um, first, I would like to point you to, to the um, uh, just briefly would like to remark that the, the, everything I've said so far is um, uh, corresponds to the SIR model, but the, the model in general is not restricted to that. So you could, could also, um, I mean, where we, will be, where we will be looking at the SIR model, um, I will give this little icon that I show in, in the top right corner. Uh, you could also look at the SI model, so people die from infection, which I will mark by this little icon, um, or you could look at multi-stage diseases. So um, infections that go to, through different stages of different infectivity um, before you progress either to recovery or in this case, case to death. Um, now I would like to point you just briefly to, to like um, a resource where you could just download uh, the, the, the source code to, to, to solve the differential equations and or a demo where you just can play around, have a look at uh, how epidemic prevalence evolves for certain networks and, and dynamic models. So you ba basically get epidemic prevalence and the average number of contacts within each subgroup. Um, but without going too much into details here, um, I would just point you to some examples. Um, and, and the easiest thing is, is really to start with the SIR model. Um, so we've been looking at really uh, epidemic prevalence in two comparative networks. We have here a Poisson network and a scale-free network, both with an average number of contacts per person of three. So the difference, basically, is it's just sketched here by these little cartoons is that, that you hear the Poisson distribution is very centered. So basically, everybody has... Uh, the, uh, I mean, everybody is centered around the mean. So that means that um, most people have a similar number of contacts and the network is rather homogeneous. Whereas if you go to the scale-free network, you have much more heterogeneity. There are super spreaders with many contacts, um, a few of them as opposed to, to many people um, who have only few contacts. And what you see, of course, is I think that's well known, but nice that the model reproduces it, that, that epidemics spread much faster in the case of, of, of scale-free networks. But we were really interested in looking at how the topology is, evolves in these cases, and so we look at the probability generating functions, and I will show you the density plots for um, the probability generating function among susceptible people, among infected people, and among recovered people. So, but as I said, this is probably uh, not too intuitive what this really means for the network. So um, we, you can note that there is a correspondence or, um, for the derivative um, of the probability generating function with the average degree. And so you see that the average degree among infected individuals increases and I mean, a bit later also in the recovered individuals, whereas the average degree among the susceptible people decreases. And this is especially true for the scale-free network where you have a really sharp increase. I mean, this is all fair enough for the differential equation. What you, in principle, also should do and should show is to validate your equations by agent-based or stochastic simulations. Um, we have done this, but I would like to skip this for this talk and... Um, would, would be glad to show this maybe um, in another context or you, you just could look up things in the publication. Um, another question that you might like to ask is what happens if demographic change occurs? So this is again, these are again three scenarios. You have a homogeneous Poisson network. Uh, at the top you see epidemic prevalence and the blue ones um, are the, uh, the degree distribution of the newcomers. And again, it's maybe not too intuitive so I, I just try to coin some simple names for these. So in the left column you have uh, the traditionalists. These are people that, who just keep the 
their contact behavior as it was. Um, then there are the risk-reducing conformists. You have here an SI model. So people being infected, being at a higher risk of getting infected, uh, have a higher mortality and leave the population. So the overall risk behavior in the population is, is going down, which means um, that, that those people adapting to the current contact behavior will also reduce risk. Then you have a third group which are just risk reducers. They just reduce their contact behavior at their own pace. And what you see is in the top column that in these cases where you have demographic change with risk reducing behavior, the epidemic may die out. Whereas in the first case, you may have persistent epidemics. And this holds similarly true also for scale free or heterogeneous networks. Um, the only thing is that the topological differences are larger and you have a faster dynamics. Um, a thing that you could also derive from the equations, and I will not show in detail here, is that there is more mixing among healthy and infected individuals in the heterogeneous networks, again supporting the faster spread in these networks. Okay, um, I'd finally give you a just brief overview about a case study in HIV. Um, I mean, what's specific about HIV is that you have a uh, um, more complex infectious profile for HIV. You start with a short period of several months with high infectiousness, which is followed by a longer period of several years with a low infectiousness, followed eventually by the onset of AIDS with again an increasing infectiousness. So we have been looking only at the first two stages, assuming maybe a bit optimistic that no transmissions occur in the last stage of an HIV infection. Um, what you also have to plug into the model is knowledge about contact behavior. There are a lot of studies about sexual networks. Um, I, I wouldn't like to go into all to the details of problems or advantages of these data, so we just look at two synthetic populations for the time being as a case study, and we denote them like as a weakly concurrent and strongly concurrent population. Uh, they have in common that they have 10 lifetime partners, and those people with a degree distribution uh, which is weakly concurrent, change their partners more frequently than those who are strongly concurrent, who have more partners but change them less frequently. And then you can also have a look at epidemic prevalence. Um, and what you see is that in the case of strong concurrency, there is a higher epidemic prevalence, both in the primarily and latently infected individuals. Um, but what is maybe interesting for public health interventions is really um, what, from which type of infections arise more new infections, so to whom do we have to target public health interventions? Um, and this can also be done with this model. At the top, uh, the, the top left uh, diagram again gives an overview over uh, the epidemic prevalence in both scenarios. The solid line cor corresponds to uh, the case of strong concurrency. The um, dashed lines correspond to weak concurrency. So we have a much faster and higher epidemic expansion and saturation in the case of strong concurrency. And you see that during this expansion phase, most infections arise from primarily infected individuals. Whereas uh, in the later stages, latently infected individuals dominate in infection events. Um, this holds actually true for the whole time of uh, epidemics for the weekly concurrent situation. So what do we learn from this? I mean, interventions should be adapted both to population characteristics and also to the stage of disease, so which might change whom you should address with your intervention strategies. Um, with these two case studies, I'm now going to a bit more into the more speculative realm, um, because what have we been looking at? I mean, we have been looking at epidemic spread, which is largely just propagation on a network. Um, one could also think of applying this like to, to propagation of information or rumors on networks, and um, maybe also to cellular signaling pathways, um, metabolic networks, a gene regulatory networks. I mean, there are certainly a lot of differences that would have to be addressed, but maybe there are some ideas that I would be glad to discuss with you to, to maybe also to transfer some of the contact, uh, concepts we've been using here to these systems. Okay, so I think it's 
time to get back to where we started, just to recapitulate, recapitulate um, whether, oops, uh, I have been able uh, to answer some of the questions here. Um, what I've been showing you uh, is uh, a model that allows for, um, for a description of epidemics in a pretty large, a wide range of um, dynamic and complex networks. And what it specifically addresses is the, 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 the mutual influence of, on the one hand, epidemic expansion, epidemic prevalence, and on the other hand, the, the dynamics of network topology. Um, I've shown you in several case studies about um, the, the use of the model for, for demographic change, a bit on mixing patterns and on a, for a HIV case study. Um, I've just, oh, and yeah, the HIV case study. And um, um, I, I've just briefly mentioned that, that I could imagine that there are further replication on in other situations where there is a propagation or networks, may it be um, information or any other flow that, that goes along through a network. Um, one thing that I did not really comment too much on is the fact that there's still a lot of open questions. Certainly, people do not make contacts randomly, so there are issues about clustering, higher order correlations about how contacts are made between people. Um, also, there are um, important issues on finite size effects, on clustering, and also um, maybe on, on active individuals. So there, there are further aspects that influence the network topology aside from the effects of an epidemic. So people may change their social behavior in the face of knowledge about an ongoing epidemic. Um, so things aren't going to be boring, and I... Um, Looking forward to your discussions. Uh, I thank you for your attention and would be glad to hear your remarks and comments on this. Thank you.